Hi guys, I'm back. This one, this is a video that we're going to, uh, part of the video series where we're going to do, talk about theory, um, mainly, uh, well, non-mathematical theory anyway, uh, a theory with very little math, if any, in it. So, and then I'll be doing another series of videos that will talk about the math and, and uh, more later on uh, about the design and the math used in, in uh, discussing the theory and operation. This particular oscillator is a very popular one that's used quite a bit in the local oscillator and radios. I have not really talked a lot about it. It's called the Tickler Coil Oscillator or also the Armstrong Oscillator since he invented it. Um, it's very similar in a lot of respects to um, and we'll deal with that uh, further in in our theory lessons when we talk about tuners but um, it's very similar to the regenerative, regenerative uh, tuner uh, coil setup for uh, regenerative uh, tune radios <clears throat> so anyway we'll get on with it um, L1 is our trickler coil or also known as our feedback coil it's tied directly to the plate of the uh, oscillator tube amplifier tube now when power is first supplied you turn first turn the radio on um, current will start flowing through the circuit and a field will start being developed an expanding field around L1 now L1 or L and L1 are wound as more or less as a transformer one coil pretty much sits over top of the other one um, it'd be something similar to this I don't know if, um, if you can see it, but this coil actually rides over top of this coil. So you could think of this as uh, L here, and then this would be L1. So <clears throat> as the field expands, then it starts cutting right through L1, which then develops a voltage in L1. Now the coils L1 and L are wound in such a way that the voltage that's developed in L1, the direction of the winding, such that when that voltage is developed, it's in the same direction as this voltage. So they add, there's no uh, negative feedback acting on this. So if they were one in, uh, Hold on. Okay, I'm back. Um, anyway, the windings in here are such wound in such a way so that when it's induced, it's in the correct polarity. If they were reversed, they would actually the polarity be wrong, and it would fight. The two coils would actually fight each other. So that's something that has to be considered. We'll go into that more in depth later uh, in the other theory video because it deals with more math. But anyway, as this uh, builds up, we start getting a current flow. And uh, basically, it's in this direction. Which creates a positive here and a negative here. As that happens, we also get a current, part of it will start flowing this direction, which will put a positive here, a negative here. Now, as this voltage builds up, we start getting a current flow that starts happening for a time being in the grid circuit. And as that current flows, the grid is actually, until this capacitor charges up, the grid is positive, so we get more and more current flowing through the tube 
through L here, the feedback coil, which in turn builds a more, more powerful field expanding outward that then induces more voltage in here, which then increases the voltage here, and this keeps going on increasing the strength of L until the tube gets to a point of near saturation or almost saturation point for the tube. As the tube approaches saturation um, it starts leveling off. No more it, it, it stabilizes so it doesn't there will not be any more increase in the current going in the plate circuit. At that point the magnetic field stops expanding. When that happens, no more in induction is happening in L1. At that point, the flow will actually start reversing then. We start discharging, and as that happens, then the flow starts going this direction, and we get positive here and negative here, which will in turn create a negative, start creating negative voltage on the grid. As the negative voltage starts happening on the grid and starts increasing, then the plate starts, the tube don't conduct as much, so then the field starts collapsing. As it collapses, it actually strengthens this, this reverse flow since they're wound in such a way as that strengthens, that strengthens this flow through here making the grid more and more negative until it gets to a certain point and it hits cutoff at that point the tube shuts off and everything stops flowing and no more current flows through the coil gives a chance for the capacitor whatever charge is still on it, a full charge on it to start discharging, continuing to charge up C to a point that we establish our grid voltage, our operating point. Now, <clears throat> once this has discharged completely, current and everything stops moving, everything stops, the plate starts, the grid is. Uh, stays pretty much where it's at and no more current flows and everything else we are we actually start to flow more current back into the tube again and the whole cycle starts flowing over again <clears throat> this process of just getting the thing started only takes a fraction of a second and it's relative to the resonant frequency that the tank circuit here is set up for which you know could be a megahertz or or greater so it happens in so fast you would never know it was actually happening now these tubes and, and most oscillator tubes operate in class C operation which basically means that their normal operating point is way past cutoff way more negative than cutoff. So they run somewhere around two and a half to four times the cutoff value. And what that does is uh, in class C operation only a certain portion, a very small portion of uh, the plate current flows only a very short period of time. The nice thing about class C is the most efficient for the tube. The tube's running at most efficient, the efficiency is the greatest at this point, generally above 80% efficiency. <clears throat> on oscillators, unlike most to any other type of amplifier, and an oscillator is an amplifier, just a special amplifier, unlike any other, a lot of other type of uh, 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 amplifiers that can either have a self-biasing circuit, such as uh, a cathode resistor here that sets a set um, amount of voltage negative on the on the grid or you have like 
a battery such as a uh, grid uh, battery C battery for the grid or you develop a negative voltage off your power supply with some dropping resistors uh, to establish a fixed bias oscillators can't do that because the fixed bias has to be in class C operation if you set it at that point the, two, the thing never starts instead what it uses what is known as a grid leak <coughs> and a grid leak bias basically is a capacitor and resistor connected together they can either be in parallel or the resistor can go across the grid cathode which generally cathodes at ground so it would be just grid to the resistor just go to ground these two operate in conjunction with each other the capacitor is actually going to charge up to a certain point will get to a maximum charge that will be the operating point eventually of where the uh, grid is supposed to operate at what the resistor is there for is for the time constant whenever you put a resistor and a capacitor together they have a um, what is known as an RC time constant and what that means is is with the resistor hooked to a capacitor whether it's in parallel or in series uh, it slows down how it, depending on its size will slow down the speed at which the capacitor discharges. The time constant is just simply figured by the capacitance times the resistance and it's measured in seconds. Consequently you want since this is an oscillating circuit you and part of this energy is what's going to charge the capacitor up and this is always switching plus minus plus minus then you want your time constant long enough that you give the capacitor it, it can charge up you don't want to have it if it's too short it'll discharge just about as fast as the oscillator is operating or trying to operate so it has to be a big enough time constant which means the capacitor and resistor values have to be large enough that the capacitor will continue to charge and won't discharge too much when the current is reversed in the circuit on the other end of the scale you don't want them too long if they're too long if it's too long a time constant then the, before the anything can get really fully built up this thing charges up to max does not discharge at all happens too quickly and the tube shuts off before much of any oscillations can even get started so what ends up happening is when you first start out the grid will go full positive for a short period of time and because there's no charge on the capacitor at all and then it'll start swinging back negative basically going in conjunction with what's happening in here in the tank circuit go back to the positive side back negative a little more positive negative a little more positive negative a little more and it'll just keep swinging until it finally gets to to a happy medium centered around the operating point this will keep swinging further and further at that point the operating point has been determined by the size of the capacitor and resistor here and when it hits that point this capacitor has got to its full maximum charge to hold that bias there then only when there's a, enough positive in the oscillator circuit enough positive voltage here to override the negative just a little bit it'll swing it just far enough to go to the positive point on the positive side so the grid goes positive for just a very short little time when it swings over that way that gives the maximum amount once it gets past cut off we start flowing current in our plate this comes clear over far enough that we get current to near but not past 
but near saturation. Once it starts swinging back the other way, the current starts dropping, and all you get is little spikes going on forever coming out of the plate. So the plate is only operating a short period of time, but operating with a lot of a lot of current when it does operate. And that keeps the oscillator going. And that's basically how it operates. They're not real complicated. Some of the uh, the biggest thing is is trying to get the size, your RC size for your time constant set up. Make sure the coils are wound properly so that they're additive. They don't fight each other. Now another thing that happens in here, <clears throat> since it is an amplifier, and amplifiers when you feed through the input signal to your output signal, the drop across here will be out of phase with the voltage here. The two are out of phase. But since what we're actually building up here is a counter EMF down here, that is actually also 180 out of degrees out of phase, which in turn is actually putting it back in here. You get 280 degree out of phases, that makes 360, so it's actually in phase. 360 is the full circle. So that allows it to be back truly in phase so that it's helping the grid out and everything is you know stays operating properly. C2 over here across the B plus or the battery. This can be a battery, it can be a you know your power supply. C2 is just a return path for the AC back. So you get your AC going through and it returns back to here. That's all it's on there for. And that's really all there I can really explain on this uh, without going in more detail with math. But that's how it, it uh, the particular coil oscillator operates. And like I said, they're one of the most common ones used. Uh, sometimes you'll see them in schematics where they look like this. Sometimes you'll see them in schematics where they'll just look like a transformer. But if you actually pay attention to the DC resistance on them, you'll see this will be like 1 or 1 to 2 ohms, and this can be 6 to 8 ohms. This has got a lot less windings than this one does. So this one will be hooked to your in your tank circuit, and this is your feedback or your ticker. <coughs> but other times they're drawn very much like this. So anyway, that's basically it on it. I, if you have any questions, uh, just get uh, leave them in the comments, and I'll try to do what I can and either answer them that way, or I'll make a video, another video on this, just you know, without the math, and and try to answer the questions. Um, uh, thanks for your comments and some of my new subscribers. I got a couple new ones, and uh, so uh, on the next video that we do, um, we'll go on to what where I'm at on the on that signal generator. We'll go over the schematic sum, and or not signal generator, signal tracer. See, I'm making that same mistake again. Anyway, uh, kind of go over the schematic a little bit and. Uh, you can see where we're at on it and stuff as as the build continues on it. I haven't really done a lot at this point. Uh, then uh, next week we'll uh, do another math video. And I'm not sure where I'm going with the next one. I might go ahead and go over the Hartley and the other oscillator again maybe a little bit or <coughs> go into something else. But We'll do another theory video. So, till next time, and yeah, guys, have a good evening.